These pea-sized vessels are the work of another kind of wasp, a potter wasp. Once again, saliva is an important ingredient. It prevents the mud from crumbling when it dries. With jaws scissoring away on the inside to keep the mud properly mixed and fluid, and front legs checking the thickness of the wall on the other, she lays the mud round and round in a strip, using a technique that human potters call coiling. When the main body of the pot is finished, this greatly accomplished potter brings another ball of mud and adds a final and most elegant flourish. In goes an egg. Now the cells must be provisioned. A potter wasp doesn't feed her larvae on chewed bodies, nor does she supply honey. She gives it living food, a caterpillar paralyzed by her sting. The lip, built so carefully around the entrance, helps to guide it in. The mouth of the pot will then be sealed with a clay pellet and the lip removed. The larva, having eaten its caterpillar and turned into an adult, emerges by breaking through the side of the pot. But although abandoned, the tough pots survive for several years. A lot of work is invested in one of these holes and if one seems vacant, another wasp will try to claim it. Once the burrow is finished, the female performs an elaborate dance around it, familiarizing herself with its surroundings so that she knows exactly where it is. And then she conceals it, so that none but she is likely to find it. Her nursery must now be provisioned, and for that, she needs fresh meat. A caterpillar. First, she paralyzes it with her sting. Thanks to her dance, she knows exactly where her hidden hole lies. Each burrow will have several caterpillars in it, and each addition requires the same stopping and unstopping of the tunnel entrance. The urge to collect caterpillars is so strong that they'll pick them up wherever they find them. Watch this. She has already laid a long yellow egg on the first caterpillar. When the tunnel is full, she seals it with special care. She uses a grain of gravel like a pneumatic ram, vibrating it by buzzing her wing muscles one of the few instances of an insect using a tool. In a few days' time, when the egg hatches, the grub will find fresh meat awaiting it. These cabbage-white caterpillars are also doomed. 
Another species of wasp injects them, not with paralyzing poison, but with eggs. Day after day, the caterpillars grow and mature, apparently unaffected. But inside them, the wasp eggs are developing. Having fed so richly on the entrails of their caterpillar host, the wasp grubs are ready to pupate as soon as they emerge, and they start straight away to spin their silken cocoons. Ten days later, they have become adult wasps and are themselves starting to search for caterpillars. This is one of them. From the purposeful way in which he's walking, it's clear that the search for prey has started. The other members of the team are not far away. They've been steadily following the monkeys for about 20 minutes, looking for an opportunity. The technique they'll almost certainly use is that one of them will be driving the colobus ahead of him. Then there will be others that go up on either side who are the blockers who won't make any attempt to catch the monkeys. And then there are chasers who go and grab at the monkey if they can. And finally, there's one male who will go up ahead and ambush it, so uh, bringing the whole trap closed. The monkeys are now getting alarmed. A driver's going up to prevent the group from settling and to drive them towards an area where they're more easily trapped. Now it looks as though they're all in position. The driver's gone them up, the blockers have gone up, and now the one who's going to make the ambush and close the ring, he's gone up too. The colobus will be very lucky if they escape now. They've got one. tearing it apart. Everyone, the hunters in the trees and the spectators on the ground, are screaming with excitement. And now the kill is brought down so that the females and others can share it. And there's the reward for that long chase, the divided body of a colobus monkey. These blood-stained faces may well horrify us, but we might also see in them the face of our long-distant hunting ancestors. 
And if we are appalled by that mob violence and bloodlust, we might also see in that too, perhaps, the origins of the teamwork that have, in the end, brought human beings many of their greatest triumphs. In queues 30 or 40 strong, they head for the drop-off on the ocean side of the lagoon. It seems that they know the way from the overall direction of current and swell, which remains constant at this depth. Lines join together into longer lines. Sometimes 60 lobsters will be marching one behind the other. The migration takes place within a few days each year, and then the whole lagoon floor is covered with parallel marching columns. Travelling in line reduces the drag of the water on an individual by as much as half. But there's another reason why it's better to march in this way. If they are threatened, they can form defensive circles. A triggerfish, one of their main enemies. It wants to attack the vulnerable legs, but it has little chance of getting past the ring of spear-like antennae. But a solitary traveler is in trouble. First, it's disarmed. Then the rest is easy. There are others ready to pick flesh from the broken limbs. Within a few minutes, all that is left is an empty shell. When the survivors reach the shelter of the rich reefs that run along the edge of the ocean drop-off, they abandon the caravans and each makes its own way. One by one, they clamber down the slope to even greater depths, where they will be safe from the storms that churn the waters hundreds of feet above. No other whale deliberately beaches itself in this way or has perfected this method of getting back to the sea. As long as the sea lions stay well up the beach, you might think they would be safe but the hungry whales are very daring. Now, several of the whales are hunting in a group. The lion was keeping just ahead of one of the whales, but was caught by another it probably hadn't seen.
This savage beating may be to separate hide from flesh. But very often, the successful hunter takes its victim straight out to sea without even killing it. And there it plays with its catch as if it were exulting in triumph. To get all the food it needs, a killer whale must catch at least three sea lion pups a day. And every day, throughout the breeding season, this group of skilled, highly intelligent hunters do just that. <laughs> 